it will get better. If there's something about being able to tell another human being that I did this and I, 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 I can't believe I did. I can't believe I hurt my family like that. I can't believe I said that to my child. I can't believe I said that to my wife or my husband. In here, we've all done that. We've all been there. We've all been there. And what I'm here to tell you is, is that with recovery, families are healed. Most of our staff are truly embraced in recovery. A lot of them went through Willing Way. A lot of them are living proof of the 12 steps and Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. So they get to see people living their life and living a really active and fruitful life and then giving back. Most important lessons that we promote, which are also lessons that Alcoholics Anonymous promotes, are that we need to stay connected. We need to stay connected to each other. And when we go off on our own and making decisions without running things by people or seeking advice or support, then we're usually headed in the wrong direction. So the largest lesson that we promote here and, and that I think I learned in, in my treatment as a patient here was to stay connected and to run things by people. It's not a comfortable setting to be in, let's be honest. Like you have to you have to wake up early some days, you may have to volunteer at the soup kitchen, you may have to ride your bike across town when it's 40 degrees outside and they don't like that. And I didn't like that when I had to do it. Um, but there's something that happens when you go through that together. Um, there's a trust. I mean, the people I went through with that I experienced that with, I would, uh, if they called me right now, I would walk out of this interview and I would go and help them with whatever they needed. That's probably the biggest part of this deal is that it's not me telling you what you need to do or <coughs> anybody else. It's you telling me what you want to do and me figuring out a way to help you do that. That's the thing that I found at Willing Way that is a little bit different than other places. Um, and I have seen that in my own recovery. When I came in, we worked on the problems that I wanted to work on. People come in here and their eyes are dull and dead. There's a dullness to them. And as a counselor over the years, is I have seen the spark come back and the life come back. And I asked a counselor many years ago when I first started in the business, what am I seeing? I said, I see this light in their eyes. And he told me their soul is returning. And I've held on to that ever since. I didn't have anything when I came here. I came in with a bathing suit, a hoodie, my driver's license, and I had shoes and no shoelaces on. And I didn't have anything else. Our patient counselors can empathize with what it's like to be in their seat, to be in these rooms, in these groups. Um, so, yeah, I can sympathize with a lot of people and a lot of things, but I think empathy is one of the things that just saturates um, throughout our staff, particularly our clinical staff. It's going to be hard to find someone that works here that has not been um, in someone's shoes that comes through here, either as a family member or a patient. It's been uh, extremely rewarding for me personally because I've walked in their shoes. When you get a call that someone's saying, I just got my one year chip, thank you. You know, I get emails that, you know, I've been sober for 15 years or, you know, you have that, that's success. That means that, you know, we did everything that we could and gave them the, the best chance somewhere safe for them to, to get sober. Basically what it boils down to, the, drug addict and alcoholic that I am, if I can do this and showed up with nothing, you can. Um, Cause I was, it was bad. If I see those amazing results and those happy faces, it is because they've done exactly what we encourage them to do, follow the recommendations. So we don't just give recommendations to the patients, we give them to the families too, and it works. It's, it's nothing like it. Um, it's just nothing like it, nothing. All right. Uh, Willing Way is actually one of many treatment facilities within the network of Summit Behavioral Healthcare. Summit Behavioral Healthcare is a network of leading behavioral and mental health centers throughout the country. Our primary focus is, the, is on the provision of psychiatric services and substance abuse disorder treatment within a flexible and dynamic continuum of care. 
Our services include residential substance use disorder treatment, acute psychiatric care, detoxification programs, partial hospitalization programs, intensive outpatient programs, health and wellness programs, and dual diagnosis treatment. Our treatment facilities are specialized in helping adults, adolescents, and families living with the effects of mental health challenges and addiction. In addition, in partnership with Psych Armor, we service veterans and first responders through our tactical recovery programs. We offer a, cultural, a culturally competent and trauma-informed environment, tailoring care for each individual using evidence-based practices proven to promote recovery. Summit Behavioral Health Care helps clients attain their potential by offering evidence-based treatment options in a caring and supportive environment. Our mission is to improve the lives we touch. We are so grateful for our diamond sponsor, Summit Behavioral Health Care. I put Angela, Angela Quadrani's contact on the screen for you. Uh, Angie Q, as she is known within the community here in town, is a huge asset. As you can hear, Summit offers pretty much everything under the sun as far as substance use disorder goes. Uh, we are grateful to have her as, as, as a community partner here at the Coalition, and we are grateful to hear our next speaker, which is sponsored by Summit. I'm going to turn it over to Olivia. Our fifth speaker of the day is John Williamson. He began his career in substance abuse counseling in 2005 at West Midtown Medical Group in New York City, where he was employed as a methadone counselor. During this time, he was also employed as a substance abuse counselor at Freedom Institute responsible for evening intensive outpatient program for adults. He also worked with adolescents and young adults who attended outpatient services there. John came to Willingway as an inpatient addiction counselor in 2010. Additionally, John managed Willingway's extended treatment program for men from 2011 to 2017. In spring of 2017, he was promoted to the executive director of extended treatment services, where he managed both men's and women's extended treatment programs. He served in this capacity until January of 2020, when he became, when he became an outreach coordinator for Willing Way on a national basis. He has experience working with children, adolescents, chronic care, acute care, geriatric, and forensic populations. Please join me in welcoming John Williamson. Hi, everybody. Um, I am uh, honored to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to do what you guys, to be a part of this. Uh, Angie Hughes told me all about it. I think it's an amazing uh, opportunity and that you folks provide this as free, a free resource to the people in your community. Um, I appreciate the committee for allowing Summit and myself to be a part of this. And I hope that I can, um, can shed some light on the, uh, the methamphetamine epidemic. Um, I don't know if someone's gonna queue up my screen for me. Is that right? Hopefully. <laughs> uh, while that's happening, I, uh, I will tell you that, you know, in, in recent years, there has been a lot of focus on the, um, on the, on the opiate addiction in this country. And that we see a lot of a lot of focus on that, and as well it should be. Uh, it's a devastating epidemic in our country. But while all the focus was on that, there was a rising trend, and and I googled just this morning, uh, rise in methamphetamine use. And there are a number of articles that talk that are published as recently as 2022, 2021, uh, that talk about the rising use of methamphetamine and the, the devastation that comes from that. So um, I want us to remember that although there needs to be a lot of focus on opiate use and opiate uh, treatment, that methamphetamine use and stimulant use is also devastating our country and, and devastating humans, human lives and families and um, everyone around us. So um, let me see if there is, uh, is someone gonna queue up my, my slideshow? There we go. Okay. Um, 
Okay, I th I, you know, when I gave this title, I look at it and every time I've done this, uh, this presentation, I think, boy, that's a mouthful, a practical view of long-term effects and recovery outcomes for individual with methamphetamine abuse and dependence. Uh, I wasn't thinking succinctly there. I was probably thinking more like a meth addict would at that point. Um, but what I really want that boils down to is rather than talking a lot about uh, statistics and, and those type numbers, I want to give you a practical view of what a uh, methamphetamine addict and what treatment looks like for those individuals. And time allowing, I want to do a, uh, I want to do a, a case study at the end of this. So um, and if you would just uh, um, go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, excuse me. Okay, so I think we've already gone on to who am I, and I know who you guys are. Thank you very much. Uh, so what I so next slide. So what I want to do is I want to talk about the training objectives in this. Um, So next slide. And someone advance the slide. There we go. Okay. Uh, we want to look at diagnostic criteria. I think a lot of people here probably know the DSM-5, and what we're, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but explore how typical process addictions, and by uh, process addictions, for those of you that, that aren't aware, I mean things like sex, gambling, hoarding, and what of those process addictions are common with individuals that are, are using meth or have a, a dependency or drug of choice of methamphetamine. We also want to talk about other common substances that are often associated with methamphetamine use to enhance or regulate that experience. Uh, they, they, there are other drugs that you can almost predict will be used with that, that substance. And then to review some of the components of effective treatment for these individuals. So, and then hopefully we will have time at the end for a, for a case study review that I have of, of an individual who went through treatment at Willing Life. Uh, next slide, please. So what do you know about meth? Uh, a lot of people hear about it, it's in the news. We, know individuals that have used it. We've heard about individuals. Um, it's a neurotoxin and can damage the dopamine and serotonin neurons in the brain. It often contains other toxins. It's, it's not an opiate or other medication prescribed drug that's produced in a lab. It's often produced in very unsanitary and, and, and not standardized ways. Uh, you know, they're made shake and bake in Coke bottles and all kinds of ways that meth is made all the way up to uh, the meth labs that you hear about. It has an effect on the body where it raises the blood pressure, the heart rate, breathing, body, body temperature, and leads to severe dental issues. A lot of these things you're aware of from the news. It decreases the appetite and a desire to sleep. You hear about meth addicts being up for days at a time, and I mean without any sleep at all for several days at a time, which can lead to other, uh, you know, mental health issues and, and uh, psychosis and can mean that it will present in very different ways and may may appear to be something other than meth use at the time that an intervention is 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 facilitated. Meth is different from and more dangerous than other stimulants. So I'm talking about things like your prescribed stimulants like Adderall or Vyvanse, as well as street stimulants such as cocaine or crack. Um, it's different from and more dangerous than other stimulants because of the larger, a larger percentage of this drug remains unchanged in the body. This allows the drug to be present in the brain longer and extending the stimulant effects. So it, it stays in your brain longer and it, by that means it, it creates a greater damage to the body and to the brain. Um, and for someone using it, this is actually something that it makes methamphetamine popular because it means that stimulant effect will go on for a lot longer time. An example to give you a perspective would be that if you took a, a line of cocaine, what you would see someone typically use a small line and they snort that line, that, that will keep a person, they'll be feeling the effects of that for around 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the exact quantity and the quality of the cocaine. 
that same amount of methamphetamine, the individual will feel the effects for eight to 12 hours. So that gives you a reference point in terms of the severe effects that it has and the, the, um, the longevity of the effects of that on the body and the brain. So why would anyone want to use it? Next slide, please. So the perceived benefits, the benefits that the individual using it feel are, there's an increase in attention and focus. Uh, you know, this isn't always on a good thing. So there's increased attention, increased focus, there's decreased fatigue, it gives an individual a lot of energy, uh, it decreases the appetite. So you're not, you're not, and sometimes people use this drug as a weight loss uh, aid. There's a feeling of power and control. Uh, there's a sense of well-being and euphoria. And there's an increased sexual desire, which leads to other problems as well. But overall, the individual feels that nothing is an issue. There is no problem. Uh, there's nothing that can't be solved. There's nothing that can't be delayed. Uh, the individuals feel powerful in control, stimulated, and, and are able to focus and pursue things that they believe at the time are important. That's where the, the difficulty comes in because what the brain is focusing on while they're using meth may be, may be things that are, are not at all important or can be even destructive or illegal or all kinds of problems can come in. There is the last part of this, the increased sexual desire is a key piece in meth use for a lot of individuals, not all, but a lot. And it does increase that desire. Um, it increases the uh, chance of uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, it increases all types of danger that is, can be associated with that. As the, as the line at the bottom says, nothing is a problem that you can't handle. Now, the flip of that is also true. When an individual is, is using methamphetamine and while the effects of the drug are being felt and experienced, nothing is a problem, everything can be overcome. Sure, I've missed work for the last three days, but that's not gonna be a problem. I'll be able to handle that. The rebound effect from methamphetamine is just as powerful. Uh, anywhere from 48 to 72 hours after the last use, an individual starts to feel, to feel uh, very overwhelmed. One dish or glass in the sink can be overwhelming. Um, there is a tendency for suicidal ideations to start occurring there. A lot of suicides happen uh, after an individual is coming down from meth use. That's a danger period for individuals that have been using a lot of meth. Um, the the you know, the, uh, the suicidal effects and the suicidal uh, ideation that happen, a lot of individuals will act on that and, and they get unnoticed or un, un, they're not paid attention to because the folks around them will think, well, he stopped using this, it's great. He hasn't used for two or three days. That actually can be a, a very big point of danger for, for individuals using methamphetamine. Next slide, please. So how do these individuals present? Much like other, you know, other addiction issues they present, there's some that come in a little stronger than others, but uh, there will of course be employment issues. Uh, individuals can, you know, addicts that are using meth, uh, if they are able to get a job, they can rarely keep a job when they're using just because they're, the effects are so long lasting and the rebound effect is so strong that you know, they're not, they're either going to be high and not able to function in a way they should be. They're going to start developing the, uh, the effects of someone who hasn't had sleep in three or four days, but is also very stimulated. And then the rebound effect where they're not able to focus on anything, very fatigued, financial issues. When you don't have a job, you, um, it is hard to maintain your finances. Housing issues, of course, come into play, um, not just because you can't pay the rent, but because of the behaviors going on, a lot of, you know, a lot of folks will uh, have, uh, they, if they're manufacturing meth at their location, then that will get them evicted, whether they're paying their rent or not. Legal issues, you hear a lot about folks that are uh, identity theft along with methamphetamine use. There's a lot of focus on technology when a person's high with this. A lot of paranoia that goes on with, with methamphetamine use. Of course, that causes relationship problems, physical health problems, like we've talked about with dental issues and heart issues, um, a 
effects on other organs in the body, um, and then sleep deprivation. Um, I, I've spoken with individuals who use meth that were up as many as five days straight without any sleep at all. <clears throat> now, if you don't have any drugs introduced in this, then, and you don't sleep for five days, there are going to be certain uh, effects that are going to happen that are going to cause a person to appear psychotic. They're going to start to hallucinate. They're going to start to um, see things, hear things. Uh, they're not going to be able to function. They're not going to be able to hold the train of thought. So when you add the drug to it, that even, that even makes that stronger. And then mood disorders and other, other mental health issues that may or may not be a subset of the addiction. By that, I mean that when an individual is using meth, they can appear psychotic, they can appear paranoid. Um, they, during the withdrawal process, there's gonna be severe depression. Um, there's gonna be anxiety associated with the, the desire to use. And so between the paranoia, the, the hallucinations, the psychotic effects, all of these other mood disorders that, that happen around it, if an individual is going into the emergency room or their doctor and presenting these symptoms and not telling the physician that they also use methamphetamine, then they may be misdiagnosed. So that is not to say that if an individual using meth, then they don't have these things too. So that's always a problem to tease out in treatment how much of the depression, the anxiety, the paranoia, those uh, issues, how much of those are related to the meth use and how much of those are freestanding mental health and, and um, just in mood disorders. It's a challenge and with a lot of treatment, I've worked with a number of treatment centers, uh, especially through my work as an interventionist, and uh, there is a, a rush to diagnose. And I've seen this cause a number of problems with stimulant use addicts because there may be a lot of things that are that are solely related to the to the use of stimulants methamphetamine in particular and it may cause a misdiagnosis so um, you know that's a it's a difficult thing to tease apart with meth use next slide please so i think we're gonna we're gonna skip this although i want to i want to just hit one or two of them so, um, you know, the, these are true for all substance use disorder, but with meth addiction, there are um, a couple of things that, that jump out as really strong, the cravings and the urges to use the substance and increase in that. Meth has a, it's an incredibly difficult drug to get, to get sober from. Um, those cravings come up. There are a lot of things that, uh, that are, that are connected to the cravings that are what I call environmental cues, things that will lead to a craving, uh, things like sex, like spending, um, hoarding behaviors, uh, you know, those type things, weight, weight loss, a desire to lose weight, those can, can really trigger cravings. And if an individual has a history of using meth with those behaviors or to, to curb weight, to uh, curb weight gain, then that can really can really cause a lot of things that, that will increase an individual's craving. Wanting to cut down on the substance use, stop using, but not managing to. Um, we talked a little bit ago about the, the rebound effect. And if, you, if you've had a period of time where you're very stimulated, where you're, you're, you know, your mind is very active, you're focusing, you're, you, you know, you're uh, energized, and then you stop, and there is a depression and a, an exhaustion, fatigue, uh, an inability to focus. Uh, the same rebound effect that would happen if someone who's taking Adderall is prescribed just stops. They're gonna have those symptoms too, but not to this degree. And so those, that rebound effect can be a huge trigger and generate a lot of cravings that will happen for that, making it extremely difficult to, to stop entirely. Next slide, please. So a lot of compulsive behaviors also go along with meth use. Um, because, because it's a stimulant and because it affects that part of the brain, uh, some common process addictions 
are uh, sexual compulsion, uh, spending money through shopping, internet purchasing in particular, uh, gambling, eating disorders, and the use of the internet. The difficulty here comes in that the same as with mood disorders and, and uh, mental health issues, is that is this a freestanding process addiction or is it simply a subset of the meth use? And it can be either. We see individuals that uh, that present with, they come in with a lot of compulsive sexual behavior. Um, also issues revolving around money, eating or internet use. And, um, and for some of those, they are, they are, are freestanding process addictions that need additional treatment. For others, they are related to the meth use. Um, in particular, the, the sexual behaviors, there is a a tendency for sexual activity with meth users to become very dark and intense. It's not just regular, um, it's not just regular, uh, you know, sex as we would talk about it if there is such a thing, but it becomes very dark and intense, can involve a lot of, um, a lot of dangerous activities. It's also very dangerous because there's very rarely uh, safe sex practices used. Money becomes a big issue. A lot of you know use on the internet. The, the internet really feeds into a lot of these. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, internet shopping, a lot of gambling, a lot of those things that go along with it. So the problem here is: is it a freestanding addiction in itself, or is it related to the meth use? And oftentimes it's related to the meth use. Um, you know, and and again, it makes diagnosis of those things difficult because there needs to be some time passed to be able to. Uh, to be able to get, get down to what the real, how to separate the problems out. Next slide, please. So it's never just the meth. Um, how to keep it balanced, kind of. What are, what are these folks that are, are using meth, uh, dependent on meth experiencing? Uh, they're experiencing a lot of depression in between. Um, their usage, they're, ex they're experiencing a lot of anxiety. Uh, there can be pain associated with meth use because of how hard it is on the body and, and the lack of taking care of yourself and your body. So there can be a lot of aches and pains and, um, and difficulties there. There can be sleep. There always are sleep issues around meth and a lack of focus. So is that ADD or is it, uh, or is it the meth use? And the, the withdrawal period. Sexual issues and how to enhance the experience. So, you know, there's uh, with stimulants, there is a strong sexual desire, but also in men in particular, a lack of the ability to perform sexually. So how do they deal with those issues, uh, sexual issues there? And then the time between binges, if that even exists. For, for some folks there, this meth use starts out as a an occasional use. Um, it can also be a weekend use, but then the period during the week can shorten considerably where the use extends into the week or starts before the weekend. And then there's this time between binges where you're experiencing the other problems we've already talked about. The lethargy, the uh, lack of focus, the lack of motivation, the inability to do your job or to, uh, to participate in your normal activities. So on the one hand, those are difficult to do when you're using the substance, but on the other hand, in between uses, it can be extremely difficult and can lead to some suicidal thoughts or suicidal attempts. So you're gonna see a lot of folks come in that may, may present themselves to a doctor or a therapist, and if they're not honest about their meth use, then they pre may present having depression, anxiety, ADD, difficulty sleeping, and if they aren't talking about their substance use, these things can seem primary, but they may be related to the meth use. Next slide, please. So one of the things that is important, I think, for all of us that, uh, that work in this field in any capacity, whether it be a, a recovery tech in, a, in an inpatient facility, whether it be in a sober living environment, whether it's a therapist, psychiatrist, 
anyone working in this theory is in this field is that we have, I had a clinical supervisor many years ago that would always ask the group in group supervision, he would say, what do we treat? And oftentimes someone new in the group would say, we treat addiction. Uh, we, treat, we treat addiction. And the answer is no, we treat people. We treat people with addiction, but we also treat families. And so I think it is important for us to remember that, especially in dealing with substance use disorder and dealing with in particular meth use, that there can be a lot of things that go on around just the meth addiction. The impact of families, the impact of the individual, the impact to employers, uh, to the community around them. So uh, we need to keep in mind that in working in this field, we treat, we treat people. We don't just treat an illness, we treat the people that have the illness and that, that um, keeps our focus in the right place. So I wanna move on to uh, our case study. So if you could bring up the next slide, please. So this is an individual um, that came to Willing Way for treatment. Uh, at the time he came, his name is Robert. At the time he came to treatment uh, at Willing Way, he was 50 years old. He was a single gay male. He was living in New York City in an apartment with a roommate who was also in recovery. Uh, he was a college graduate. He was, he was employed in a professional job. Uh, he had a history of two long-term relationships, one five years and one 10 years of living together. There was a history of, of, of complaints of and treatment for a depression with suicidal ideation and a plan, but no attempt. There's a longstanding family history of alcoholism and addiction on both sides of the family. Robert came from a supportive middle-class family and friends. Uh, he was a blackout drinker. His, his youth started as a blackout drinker in, in high school. Uh, so the substance use had progressed over the years from an age of about 14 or 15 when it began. Uh, blackout drinking in high school came from a very small town um, where he was born and raised. And he, uh, so there wasn't other drug use really available during his early life. And there was, and he was in a small town, so there weren't other substances readily available. So alcohol was a drug of choice at that time. And so during high school, he did progress to the point of being a blackout drinker. This continued into his college years uh, where he continued primary use of alcohol, no other substances other than alcohol until he graduated from college, uh, moved to a little bit larger city, not quite in New York City yet, but moved to a little bit larger city. And uh, Alcohol was, there was an addition of marijuana and cocaine, and there was a uh, trauma tragedy that happened in his life where his sister passed away, and he was prescribed some Xanax and some benzodiazepines to deal with the anxiety, and also some uh, Adderall to deal with the, or some Ambien to deal with the lack of sleep. So there was, the drug use had started to come into play, still a blackout drinker, Still not heavy use of drugs, but the, uh, the other substances had started to come in there. He stopped drinking due to the effects of alcohol on his life, relationships, finances, and job. In 1992, he decided that he would stop drinking. At that time, he was about um, 34, 35 years old, as I remember. Um, he stopped using at that time stop drinking at that time, but didn't, did not stop the other substances. Like a lot of folks that, that start to get sober, they tend to focus on the, the drug of choice that's causing all the difficulties. They tend to focus just on that and the other drugs that are maybe not used that much, maybe ones that they would even report they don't like that much, they don't get very much attention. And in Robert's case, what happened was the drinking stopped, but the drug use escalated. It was the classic example we often give of the whack-a-mole arcade game where uh, you push down the alcohol use and the drug use escalate. Um, the longest period off meth during that, during that drug use is when Robert came in contact with methamphetamine um, and started using that and it instantly became a drug of choice by his description. Um, it, was, it was something that he started using on the weekends only. 
and this progressed into uh, week use where the weekend would last until Monday or Tuesday and would start again on Wednesday or Thursday. So it wasn't long before meth use was daily. The longest period off of methamphetamine was about eight years prior to a relapse in 2008. Um, next slide, period, please. So when, when Robert relapsed on marijuana, it was interesting too, there's a lot of discussion about the effects of marijuana and, um, and is it addictive? And that still goes on today, even though there's, there's research that proves that it is. But Robert, when he quit, when he first got sober from everything, um, the, la the most difficult thing he had to stop was marijuana. He described that he would uh, that he was able to quit the meth and able to quit the drinking and able to quit all the other substances that were in use, but try desperately to hang on to marijuana use because there were really no consequences from marijuana use. No con, never been arrested, never missed work. By his description, the worst thing that happened would be he would smoke a little bit in the evenings, he would eat everything in sight, and he would uh, sleep like a baby. So in his mind, there was no problem with the marijuana. There was one consequence of using the marijuana, and that was he was unable to stay sober off the other substances. He had a variety of, of um, you know, periods of sobriety when he was trying to get sober. Uh, he would stay sober for a day, two days, a week, 30 days, six months, a year, but inevitably he would always go back to use. And as soon as he would relapse, he would go back to, um, to use of methamphetamine. It was suggested to him that he uh, needed to stop the marijuana. And although he had a great deal of difficulty with that, once he did, he was able to stay sober off of everything for a period of eight years. Uh, Robert describes that he was, not, uh, he was not focused on his own recovery, but he had gotten, he had, he had worked in a professional job, but he had also gotten credential to work in this field and had gotten uh, and, and had stopped paying attention to his, what he needed to do for himself, but was very focused on working with other folks in treatment and trying to help them be sober. One evening, he describes being out with a group of individuals that were, they weren't in recovery, but they didn't necessarily need to be. They were not, their lives were very functional. They did not describe themselves as alcoholics or addicts. And they, one of them pulled out a joint and said, would you like to uh, have this? And, he, and Robert said, yes, without even thinking. Um, within seven days of smoking marijuana, he had progressed to IV meth use. Uh, it was like it woke up, the, woke up the beast. And Robert had never used methamphetamine IV. He had never done that. But within seven days, he was seeking out and in New York City successfully found someone that could show him how to shoot meth and teach him how to do that. The other substances used along with the methamphetamine were GHB, marijuana, alcohol, cocaine, and crack. And I think these are, I, we need to talk about this for just a moment because these are common drugs that are used in conjunction with meth. GHB is a drug that is commonly used to enhance a sexual experience, in particular with gay men. Um, marijuana can be used to kind of on the uh, take the edge off of the of the meth use and kind of sand the edges as Robert would describe. Of course, crack and cocaine were other stimulants, so they were always fair game, and alcohol was a was a stable there. He had been receiving prior to this relapse. He had been receiving treatment for depression, anxiety, ADD, and difficulty sleeping. Now, one of the things that he confessed to was when he went into uh, a psychiatrist and a therapist to talk about these uh, disorders, he, he did not inform them that he was using methamphetamine. So of course he's presenting with depression and anxiety. Anytime he's not using, he's becoming more depressed, he's becoming anxious, his inability to focus um, was, was a result of his uh, lack of meth use and difficulty sleeping was a, was a result of the meth use. So, and these things are not, they are not always a subset of the addiction, but often they are. 
and this presents a, a difficulty in diagnosis as we talked about earlier and it did in in robert's case he was unable to um he was unable to get properly diagnosed and continued to use meth, but now was on medications for depression, anxiety, Adderall for ADD, and Ambien for difficulty sleeping. So there's quite a, one of the things that is frequent in addiction treatment that certainly was true with Robert was that his addiction progression, which we often think of as using a substance, more and more of a, of a substance more and more frequently, but there's a third dimension to it. It goes up and out, meaning that we add more substances. It's not just an increase in quantity and frequency of a substance, it's an increase of substances as well. And this often happens in, in substance use disorder. He had been prescribed Adderall, Effexor, Wellbutrin, and Ambien um, for, these, um, for these disorders. Um, he had been really living an extremely double life. On the one hand, he had the professional life, the family that was very supportive. Um, he was viewed as a person in recovery and had a, had a very difficult time acknowledging that he had relapsed because he was working in the field. Next slide, please. So Robert came to Willingway for treatment. He was inpatient treatment for six for six weeks. Um, during that time, he received individual and group counseling. He received, there was family involvement. Family program was conducted with an older brother and a sister-in-law. These were the only individuals that could attend the family program. Uh, he was taken to all, sorry. The next group is in 10 minutes in the sunshine room. Thank you. Um, I can tell where I am today. Um, he was, uh, family program with an older brother and a sister-in-law. He was taking off all prescribed meds to establish a baseline. Uh, sometimes this is a good thing to do. In Robert's case, it was a good thing to do because he was able to, and the, all of the problems that he was experiencing with, with his meth use were related to his meth use. That is not always the case, but Robert was very fortunate in the sense that he was able to come off of all of those meds and was able to stay off of them. Uh, some individuals, now he was, in, um, he was in extended treatment, as it says at the bottom, for and outpatient with that for a total of 16 months. So Robert was in a very safe environment and able to come off of those medications and make sure that they were related to the addiction. Um, other individuals are not as fortunate in the depression, the anxiety, um, all the other things that can go along with it may be issues in and of themselves. I guess one of the one of the more difficult things in treating meth addicts is whether it be the mood disorders and the mental health issues, or whether it's the other process addictions or compulsive behaviors, kind of segmenting those out into what's related to what, so that we're not giving folks in treatment unnecessary diagnosis or unnecessary treatment but also on the other hand that we are treating what is necessary to be treated. During, uh, during Robert's time in, um, in treatment, he was terminated from his employment due to performance. Um, he was also lost his housing while he was in treatment. In one sense, that was uh, a bad thing, but in another sense, it did provide him the opportunity to stay in sober living and stay in um, you know, stay in, in treatment there for a longer period of time, which can, you know, contributed to Robert doing well, doing very well after treatment. I would, um, you know, one of the things when I'm, when I'm doing this presentation for a room full of people instead of uh, virtually, the question always arises, uh, how is Robert doing today long-term? Because this was several years ago. How is he doing today? And um, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very pleasing thing for me to inform you that I am in fact Robert. And this was my case study of my treatment and my addiction. And I can, I can tell you that there, is, there are individuals like myself that with the proper treatment and the proper diagnosis that we are able to remain sober and, and function, have a great life and use use what we've been through in our addiction in an ability to help those that, um, 
and an ability that help those, to help those that are suffering with the same thing. It's an honor for me to have been able to present you guys with what, you know, and, and in my treatment experience, not as a, not as a patient, but as a, as a counselor and as an interventionist, I have worked with a lot of, of folks working with, um, working with methamphetamine and stimulant addiction. And I can tell you that my, my experience in terms of the behaviors, in terms of the other diagnosis, in terms of the, um, in terms of the treatment needed is fairly common. Um, meth use, meth addiction takes, takes time. It's one of the biggest things that those individuals that are dealing with meth addiction can have on their side is if they have time and a community around them that can help them. Um, it's been an honor to present to you guys today. I, I think it's, um, it's wonderful about this summit and I'm really grateful that activities like this are available, resources like this are available. So thank you. And I think we've got a little less than 10 minutes. So I would, um, I would open it up for uh, questions at this time. And you can, you can feel free to ask anything about my case study, about myself or, or about my uh, experiences as a, uh, as a clinician working with those dealing with methamphetamine. Thank you. Thank you, thank that you. was a really incredible story. So we have about 10 minutes left, so I'll just go ahead and jump straight into questions. Um, what is the most important thing for us to remember as clinicians working with people in recovery? Working with people in recovery is that, hmm, interesting. Um, not just meth, I'm assuming, but people in recovery. I think that time is necessary. I think that a community is necessary, um, you know, and, and I, I'm a 12-step guy, but that's not the only place to find recovery, a recovery community, but it is the easiest. So um, when you're working with someone who's in, in addiction, active in their addiction, and they, they're needing treatment, to realize that there's a lot of shame around, a lot of shame around the activities that have gone on in their addiction because we don't mean to make the messes we make. We, um, I, it used to annoy me when I would hear people say things like, well, he must not have valued that relationship so much, or he must not have valued that job so much. It must not have really meant that much to him because our addiction actually gets in the way of us being the person we really want to be. I always phrased it that I did the things I did in terms of my employment, my family and relationships. I did those things in spite of how much I cared about them because of my addiction. So realizing that, that there's a lot of shame around that and, and giving time for a person to talk about that. Um, I know that I, you know, and this is probably because I grew up in an alcoholic family, but I'm very cued in to other people's reactions. So when I sense that judgment from somebody, even whether it's just a, a look or a, uh, or a, you know, something, a, a inflection in their voice, I can pick up on it. And I, and I would shut down in my early recovery. I don't do that today, but I would shut down in my early recovery. So trying to make an approach of being non-judgmental and being a resource for them, I think would be one of the one of the most important things that I would see, that coupled with time. Recovery takes time. I guess going off of that, did you have any issues with people accepting you as a clinician in recovery? Issues with people accepting me as a clinician in recovery? No, in fact, um, most folks uh, see that as an asset. Um, you don't have to be in recovery to work, uh, to work in the field, but certainly those of us that are in recovery working as a clinician um, you know, I, I, I tend to take that story. I'll, I'll tell you now that how my, uh, my addiction ended or my addiction got, got interrupted the last time is that I was working as an interventionist and I was working as a clinician in New York City at Freedom Institute, which is an outpatient and working with an intervention group. And uh, I had started using meth again. It was a short relapse. It was only about three months long. It was horrible because I was counseling people and doing interventions while I was using the substance. But it ended, today it's, I can laugh about it. On that day, I can promise you I didn't laugh about it, but I, I dropped a meth pipe in the middle of the intervention office where I worked. So 
that's a real showstopper. <laughs> that really gets a lot of attention. And I can tell you that I was in willing way in treatment within 24 hours. So, um, you know, and um, that was something that was the worst day of my life. But when I look back on that, it was the best day of my life. And I've been able since then to use that story and helping people when they, you know, when they are struggling with the things they've done and there's all that shame, I can share my experience. Um, I know there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of controversy or question around how much of ourselves do we share as a clinician. And I, I ascribe to the school of, I share about my story when I think there's a need and when I think it can be helpful. I don't just blanketly share it, but if I feel like it will benefit that individual, whether it's how it affected my family, or how it um, how it affected my job, then I, uh, you know, I try to share then, but I don't blankly share. Definitely. But I think it's an asset to me. It has been. Yeah, no, I agree. And everybody at our coalition is in recovery from something, so I would definitely agree. Yeah. Um, so, final question: How do you assess a client to determine if a client is using stimulants or if there are underlying mental illness? Hmm. Um, well, ideally, the patient would acknowledge that they're using substances, but, you know, to ask a question, just not in an, in an accusatory way, but just to say, you know, is there, what's your substance use look like? You know, do you drink, do you use up to substances, but without trying to pin it on that. Uh, oftentimes, individuals that I've assessed. Now, when, when individuals come to Willing Way or they came to Freedom Institute, they were coming there because of a known substance use. So it was known that that was there. But in, an, in a private practice or an outpatient, um, which I was the patient in those, I know that I was not always honest about my substance use. Um, in the beginning, I didn't really see that as the problem. I was presenting symptoms that, you know, led to a diagnosis of you know, ADD and sleep disorder and all those kind of things, which coincidentally, when I quit using meth, instantly cleared up. Not instantly, but over time. Um, that's not true for everyone. So they can be separate, they can be together, they can be related or they can be unrelated. I think the big thing is time, developing that sense of trust where the individual will, you know, will, uh, will start to talk about those things. Uh, the the rapport we have with our patients is, um, is primary and being able to establish that sense of caring and trust and support will open a door where, where someone will hopefully acknowledge what's going on and then you can start to work on that if it exists. Yeah, cool. So we have time for one more question and our director, oh. Jack Wyatt, oh. wants to ask a question. Oh no, well, it's just still <laughs> leading straight off of that. Hey, that was an amazing presentation. Love the way you ended that. But like, so sometimes often after they get out of treatment, one thing that I've experienced and like you were talking about being misdiagnosed is sometimes people will be like in a mental health manic episode and sometimes it'll appear that they're on meth and then sometimes vice versa. So I think that was kind of the question she was like, how in that sense can you differentiate? Is there any kind of signs or things that you could look for because we've often we've often misdiagnosed that ourselves uh thinking that someone was just having a manic episode when the whole time they were using methamphetamine and then vice versa um we thought they were on meth because they had all the symptoms the, the dilated pupils everything else but in in fact they were having a mental health crisis and so how do you what's what's a way that we as people that work with people that are on the streets and in in recovery how can we differentiate between that sometimes when it arises? Well, there are some, some signs that a person is using meth that may not necessarily be part of a manic episode. One would be uh, folks tend to, not everyone, but some individuals tend to do things like picking. You'll see a lot of scabs where a meth addict will pick at their skin. Um, so those kind of physical appearances, certainly if there are um, if there's a history of drug use, if they acknowledge a history of drug use, then it could be a relapse they're in. It's very hard to diagnose those things because on a, in a first visit, like to an ER, um, when I was sober in New York and I would take, you know, folks that were in the middle of a meth binge to an ER, oftentimes they would be diagnosed with things like paranoid schizophrenia because they would be paranoid and they would be presenting all the symptoms that weren't present when they were sober. I don't know that short of a drug test, 
I mean, if they can do a, a drug screening to see if the drugs are in their system, that's not always possible, but if we can, then that will certainly help clear that up. Even if they are on meth, it doesn't mean that that's the sole cause of the other things that are going on. That's what I mean when I say that, you know, folks that are using meth require a, a great deal of time. They require time to sort through all these, these issues. Um, but if they're, if they're going to be hospitalized because of, a, uh, because of a manic episode, then certainly a drug screening would be performed and, and that could help separate that out. Cool. Thank you so much, Don. Um, so we're Thank about to go to a break right now. Um, and we will be back at, let's see, 240. Hey, everybody, I just wanted to get on here and say, first of all, thank you, John. What an amazing presentation. That was awesome. I we were actually all sitting here in the office after you were done. And we go, wow, that was really cool. So thank you so much. And, and thank you to Summit for, for getting you to us. Uh, that was a really amazing presentation. Um, we are about to go into a break, but I just wanted to let everyone know that we will be at Memphis in May. Uh, we have a booth at Memphis in May, so please come see us. If you're going to be there, we will be there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with the other vendors. We will have a sober tent. If anyone needs rides home, you need a place to hang out with other sober people, we will be distributing Narcan to those who need it, those who qualify. Uh, we will be out there trying to do anything that we can to help people because that's what we try to do. So we would love to see you all there. And uh, we'll see you all after the break for our last and final speaker. <laughs> 